Hi, welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. I'm Anthony Lowe, the Physio Detective. And I'm Marika Hart from Herosphere. Together we interview leading authorities, we answer questions and share our thoughts to provide the general public with the best quality information that we can find on all aspects of women's health. Please remember that the materials and the content on this podcast are intended as general information and they're for entertainment purposes only. They're not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Now sit back, grab your favourite beverage, or do your thing, and enjoy the show. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Women's Health Podcast. Um, I am one of your hosts, Marika Hart, and I'm here with my co-host, Anthony Lowe, the physio detective. How are you, Anthony? Well, thank you, Marika. Nice to speak with you again. Always a pleasure, Anthony. It feels like it's been about two weeks. Actually, no, that's a lie because we do, we do talk intermittently in between quite a bit as well, don't we? We do. It's two weeks since we <laughs> recorded the, the podcast. The it is. It is. And we're trying our best to um, put something out every couple of weeks. And we've had some lovely suggestions from our audiences. Uh, audience, sorry. I don't know where that came from. But if anyone has suggestions of topics or uh, people you'd like us to talk to, as always, we love love suggestions from people because this is all about all of you and we want to provide resources and fabulous information that is um useful for you clinically if you're a clinician or um if you're from the general public give you some tools that can help you with um with life really and on that note um that is a fabulous intro to our guest today who is jane foster now um welcome welcome to the podcast jane it's lovely to have you here today yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks. And I'm just going to describe a little bit uh, about what Jane does. So J Jane's an educator and she was really concerned about all the false narratives that are out there and, and are still embedded in our culture. Uh, and she wanted to create a simple everyday language that could be used by everyone to help build some new positive narratives and to help eradicate stigma and judgment and to really help enable people to regain control over their mental and emotional state. Um, because a language that could, this is creating a language that could replace blame and judgment and retaliation with empathy, compassion, and responsibility. And Anthony and I were really, really excited to have um, Jane on the podcast. She was highly recommended by one of our colleagues, Robin, um, over in Queensland. So I'm guessing you're in Queensland too, Jane. I am, yeah. I'm on the Sunshine Coast, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Which is, which is probably the best place to isolate. <laughs> it's been amazing. <laughs> I'm sure it's really rough. You might have to send us some pictures. Um, Jane, can you tell us a little bit about, um, about My Turn, your business? And I, I would love to hear how it came about. So, you know, what was the process of, or maybe your experience prior to that that made you think, well, we need, we need a new tool. We need something to really be able to help people more. Absolutely. And I think by saying it's um, being a teacher, the last thing we needed was a new tool because there's so many that I wanted to create something that went beyond that. So it changed mindsets because the people I was dealing with, I was dealing with with the kids and staff and parents, you know, people looked fine on the outside, but on the inside they weren't. And I wanted to know why. Why was this happening that um, even though their home lives looked fantastic, everything looked as though it was going okay. But um, I found that uh, they weren't coping inside. And I wanted to really drill down and, and work out why. And that's when I looked at the narratives that were trying to, what the people were trying to live up to. For example, that life is perfect, I need to be happy all the time, all of these things that are really culturally embedded in everything that we do. And I wanted to create a language that changed the stigma of mental and emotional health. Because when I was doing my PhD, I did it with first year university students, I tested the language. And I would go into um, a lecture theatre and there'd be you know, one or 2,000 students there. And as I was talking to them, because you know yourself, if you've got someone, you know, they're listening, they're into what you're saying. And I found as soon as I mentioned mental and emotional health, everything changed. 
that that doesn't all apply to me. I'm fine. I'm okay. You know, it was this real stigma of um, I don't need this. This is for someone else. And that's when I realised I needed to change um, the language, which is basically create a metaphor that's totally objective, that anyone can use from one year old right through to 101. And because it's an everyday language with just some simple changes, people will be able to use it every day, which will then start to change the neural pathways in their brain of all this judgment and everything else, especially at the moment. And that's why I came up with my turn. I came up with the word turn first and turn stands for take emotional responsibility now. And I thought you turn, we turn. And I thought, no, it has to be my turn because each person has to do this themselves. And it's only then through example, can you teach someone else? So this isn't something that you think, oh, I'll give this to someone else. This is something that, well, hang on, I'll do it first and then I'll be an example for those people around me. So that was basically, yeah. And I did the, uh, I tested the language with um, a group of first year uni students and all they got was a message a day. They didn't meet me, I didn't meet them. And it was a text message with the language in it. And at the end of the 10 weeks, I did a pre and post test. And the end of the 10 weeks was during exam time. And I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to get any results here because the uni students are really um, quite stressed at that time. And I found that the control group virtually didn't change, but the um, test group, the SMS group, changed on everything. It's increased their psychological well-being, their life satisfaction, um, their purpose. It uh, decreased their psychological distress levels to below that of the average um, uni student. And this was just with a text a day in 10 weeks. But not only that, when I interviewed some of them, um, out of the 20 I interviewed, four of them said it actually stopped them from suiciding. And that was when I thought, whoa, this is serious. This, this really has um, potential. And that's what I've made it my life's purpose now. I want this to be a language that everyone speaks and that we get rid of the judgment because I think um, the judgment of others is there, but I think what's really destroying people is the judgment towards themselves. And that's what this relaxes and um, it gives people the permission to feel whatever they want to feel. That's, um, that's really fantastic, Jane. Um, you know, you, you sent us some materials to read through and I read through everything and um, I found it fascinating and, and I love the metaphor. I love that it's science-based. I love that it's based on uh, principles that um, are used, therapies that are used out there. Um, can you, uh, and I love that, you know, you were able to do just an SMS only group versus a group that didn't get it and, and really see how it affected people's lives, particularly university students. Um, so, you know, it's it's been fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit more about what, um, the My Turn City is about and the roads and the metaphors and the, the different components that you've developed and the language around it. Because I, um, you know, you said it's quite objective and I love that, you know, we, we're talking about roads and steering wheels and, um, you know, just to avoid that stigma that talking about my mental health um, has around it. Exactly. Well, if you see behind me, I've got a map and that's the My Turn City map and it's divided into red and green roads. And the way that we do it, and most people know automatically what emotions will go on the red road, what emotions will go on the green road. Even two-year-olds know. You know, it's, in, it's amazing, you know, when I do it with little kids, how much they've been able to take on board just from the surroundings. So the red roads are rough and the green roads are smooth. But what's happening at the moment is people are judging those red roads as bad and the green roads as good. And this is where it's all going wrong. You know, I say to, I say to kids, okay, if I'm on a smooth road, 
am I going to increase my driving skills? And they go, yeah, yeah. So if I want to get a better driver, which roads should I travel? And they said the smooth ones. I said, well, hang on. And this is what we're thinking as a society. If you think about it, if I'm on a smooth road, that's easy. I'm not being challenged at all. Whereas you put me on a rough road and I'm contending with rocks and, you know, ice and all sorts of things. If I don't improve my driving skills, then I'm going to crash. And, but what are we doing as a society and as parents? And there's no judgment here because I did it too. We're picking our kids off the rough road and putting them on the smooth road before you, they even hit the ice, oh, sorry, which means James. that, yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to, sorry, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. I was just thinking, do you think we're, we're sort of um, giving a message to children that life's supposed to be happy and easy and um, rainbows? Absolutely. Rainbows? and to actually feel sad or angry or depressed or up and down and have these fluctuations is um is not a good thing yeah absolutely because we've we've had a couple of generations now where we've tried to make the road smooth for them and you know we've called them helicopter parents we've even got lawnmower parents now you know everyone trying to make the path smooth you know, even with our relationships, with our marriages and everything, you know, everything's supposed to look really good. And if you look at it, a pulse rate, a pulse goes up and down, doesn't it? That shows we're alive. What happens when it flatlines? You're dead. And yet we're trying to get a life that's flatlined, you know, that it's smooth and, and it's, it, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And that's what my turn teaches you, that it's okay to be like this. Like if you're anxious, if you're an anxious person and you're wired to worry, what we're doing at the moment is we're virtually saying you shouldn't be on that road, you should be on this smooth road. And that's virtually telling the person you have to change who you are. And it's not about that at all. It's about understanding that you can actually be out of control on any road. Because the other judgment we have, other than being bad and good for the roads, we say red roads are out of control and green roads are in control, those emotions. And that couldn't be further from the truth. One of your most powerful roads is being on an angry road in control. You know yourself, if you're on an angry road and you're out of control um, and you're yelling at some, someone, kids especially, when you yell, they turn off. Oh, mum's yelling or dad's yelling or so-and-so's yelling. They actually don't listen to what you're saying. Whereas if you say, I am choosing to be angry because of what you've done, is totally different to saying, why did you do that? I told you not to do that. So people think the red roads are all out of control. But how many people are on a green road out of control? Overdoing alcohol, drugs. I had a little eight-year-old the other day tell me, oh, my, my brother gets out of control on a green road every weekend. I said, oh, that's interesting. How? And he said, oh, party drugs. He gets party drugs. You know, all of these things are, uh, and little kids, overexcited. They're out of control, overconfident. You know, they, that then, because fear is a really important emotion that we need to feel, as are all the emotions. And if they don't have fear, they might do something that's dangerous to themselves. The definition of out of control for my turn is you're either hurting yourself, hurting someone else or hurting something else. Like people who aren't eating or who are overeating or over drinking are actually hurting themselves. So the definition, that they, definition is that they are out of control. Hurting someone else out of control doesn't have to look like this. It can be very quiet and subtle and someone just gently turning their back on you all the time in your work, you know, um, your business or wherever you are or friends, people at school not having you in the group. Uh, you know, that if you're deliberately turning your back on someone, you're actually out of control because you're hurting someone else. And the amount of people who look at you and say something really nasty with a smile on their face, they're out of control because they're hurting someone else. So this language makes it really easy and objective to see, well, are you on a rough or smooth road and are you in or out of control? Which is so much easier for anyone to reply to because there's no judgment. I actually don't mind if you're on a rough road. If you're on a rough road, you, it has a purpose. 
because at the moment, our, all those red roads, they don't have a purpose other than you need to get off those and go onto a green road. Whereas the red roads are the things that build resilience. And as we know, very few people have resilience because we're lifted off that red road before we hit ice. And it means if someone is on a red road out of control and they're going towards ice and there is no one there to lift them up, they lose control because they've never, they haven't been taught how to handle it. And so what this does is it teaches you that you can say you're on any road. Of course you can be angry. Anger defines boundaries. You can be jealous. You know, all of us have a moment where, whether we mean to or not, we can say something that hurts someone else. So it's not actually what happens, it's how we respond to it that makes us who we are. You cannot control someone else. And that's where the steering wheel comes in. Because the steering wheel, only one person has control of that car. And um, at the moment, what we're doing is we're giving other people control of that steering wheel through the language that we use. For example, if I say to you, you are making me angry, who has the control, you or me? If you are making me, then I'm actually giving you my steering wheel. I'm giving you control. And, this, and we say it all the time, he's making me angry. You know what? It's the government's fault. It's COVID-19's fault. It's my job's fault. We're constantly blaming someone else. Now, when you blame, you're actually giving them your steering wheel. You're giving them control. And once you do that, you become a victim. And we all know that's a very nasty place to be, to be a victim. And so most people, to contend with that feeling of victim, they retaliate. And this retaliation can be out here or it can be inside. So it can be towards someone else. You are making me angry, so I'm going to yell at you. It's your fault I feel like this. Or it can be internal. I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I can't do this. And it's this retaliation that is sending people out of control even more. Because you know what, if you constantly blame, then you don't have control. And that is horrible. So my turn teaches you, it doesn't matter what's going on out here, people or circumstance, you have the choice of how you respond to it. And I think I, what I need to say here is that my turn deals with the minor things. It's preventative. It doesn't deal with, you know, someone coming in with a shotgun. Oh, they're on a red road. It is for the minor things that gently build up. And my turn is about teaching you how to empty that glass because we all have lots of minor things that happen every day that gently fill the glass. And we've all seen friends of ours or people we know who seem to have lost control mentally and emotionally. And we look into their lives and think, well, what's the big thing? Look, they look as though they have a perfect life. And so often it's not a big thing. It's the combination and the culmination of all those little things. So my turn is that, because I know someone said, oh, so you're saying it's okay to be on a red road. So that means the bullies, it's okay. I say, no, it's okay to be on a red road in control. Someone who is hurting themselves or someone else are out of control. And this is, the whole thing is based on a salutogenic perspective. And because at the moment, most things are pathogenic, especially um, according to stress. So stress comes down and you go to the sickness, the pathogenic end of the con health continuum. So stress coming down here is going to make you sick, basically. Whereas my turn is based on the minor stresses come down here. They're not going to send you over there. They're going to send you to the healthy end. So if you can handle your minor stresses properly, it's actually going to build your health. And that's what's so important for um, therapists, clients, no matter who you're dealing with. I think that analogy works really well in um, just thinking actually in some of the injuries and, you know, sporting you know, with the sports people that we work with, we know that minor stress on a or some kind of stress on a body will help build strength, build resilience throughout our bones, tendons, muscles, 
So, you know, why not our, our minds? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why it's such a, a simple metaphor to use. And also, you know, with injury, um, especially if you're someone who is very fit and um, all of a sudden you have an injury and you can't perform anymore, so often they feel a failure because they're judging that an injury is bad. No, an injury is rough. Like for the, at the moment, I'm, um, my knee, I was actually talking to the doctor yesterday, my left knee, I've had osteochondritis desiccans in that left knee. And so the end of the femur dies and falls off. And I, you know, I, I taught skiing, bushrike, walking, kayaking. I was an outdoor education teacher. I did everything. And now it's the medial side is absolutely destroyed. There's no cartilage, there's no medial meniscus, there's no nothing. And so I'm waiting to get a 3D printed knee. And I can't do that till next June because I didn't have health cover. And this is, it's 24 seven pain. Now, talking about pain, pain is not something that is negative. Pain is rough. So you get to, to choose how you want to respond to it. And it's knowing that if you're injured, you're not failing. If your injury is taking a while to get better, you are not failing. It's an opportunity to build more resilience, to increase your driving skills. Because it's this judgment that is, is getting us all in strife and feeling that we're failing and we're useless and hopeless. It's, um, it's really interesting that you mention about pain. I, when I was looking through the materials, you talked about like physio, physiotherapy in particular uh, was mentioned in there and pain as well. And I was just thinking when you were explaining my turn, just for those who are listening, they might think that it's for children, but actually this program is designed for people of all ages. Um, you know, you did university students, I noticed on the website, and in the materials, you can have it for workplaces, you can have it for um, individuals, for families, for schools. So this has been adapted for, um, it seems like people of all ages from very little children, like you mentioned, two-year-olds, all the way through to adults. And, you know, you're including yourself and we, we don't have to tell people how old you are, but um, it's safe to say I'm you're 62. older than 21. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay, there you I, go. Don't, I don't mind. Yeah. Um, and so that sounds like it's a, it's a really applicable um, resource for people of all ages. Um, we've, we've spoken about pain. We've spoken about people dealing with stresses. And it sounds like the accumulation of stresses and, and, um, and you know, we talk about power. Um, you know, are you letting somebody have power over your life? That's how I'm reading the steering wheel. Absolutely. Are you letting somebody take control of your steering wheel and dictating how, well, which roads you go on and, you know, taking control of that steering wheel back? Am I reading the material correctly? Absolutely. Um, and, it's, Absolutely. and, you know, you, you've mentioned, I had to go look up salutogenesis, which is a medical approach focusing on factors that support human health and well-being. Um, so a salutogenic model is concerned with the, late, the relationship between health, stress and coping, um, which is fantastic because it's health focused as opposed to, I'm guessing, disease and, um, you know, like a, a disease focused type approach, which mm. both Marika and I love. Um, we're all about the health and well-being. Um, so with, um, with what's going on with um the red roads the rough roads you've spoken about how it builds resilience and the green roads are good for developing health um we're not talking about societal and cultural systemic injustices being solved by doing my turn you talked about it being the little things the comments the turning the back the eye rolls the you know the the deliberate ignoring and, um, you know, those people are defined in your My Turn City as being out of control. Um, one question I had about that, because I'm very literal. Um, <laughs> what if they're deliberately in control and just wanting to hurt you? That's still out of control in the model. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Right. 
but doesn't you don't matter want to how let them... in control they look. Yes. You know, it's yeah. Right. They just um, want to. And hurt it's like you. people who um, who choose not to eat. You know, to starve themselves. They're saying, "I'm in control," but in actual fact, they're not because they're hurting themselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So how I wanted to ask about how people of all different ages are finding this model, you know, and, and I do want to ask about some of the other things, some of the things that you call taps and pets, but yeah. how are people responding? How are children responding? How are adults responding? People with pain responding to this type of thing, because what I really love about this is at the heart of it, it's empowerment. It's about, mm -hmm. Uh, taking control of the steering wheel of your life and being in charge again and, and being able to choose how you respond to a situation, be it a healthy one, a green road, or a rough one where something unpleasant is happening to you, but not just trying to leap off the red roads, but navigating yeah. through it. That's how I'm hearing you say it. So you navigate the red roads and you find your way back to the green roads as opposed to being rescued and, um, and taken Absolutely. right off it. And you don't have to get back onto the green roads all the time. There's some people who spend most of their time on the red road and you know what, that's okay because their life as it is, I'd be on a red road too, but they learn to take control and they understand they need times on the green road so they can process what's happening and build their health. So it's about that combination. But as far as how people are reacting, it was interesting when I first did this, because I did it with uni students, someone said, oh, the little kids won't understand this. This is far too complex. They're the ones who get it straight away. Like there was a, um, a kinder child who was three and he was coming out of his kinder and one of the other boys said something really mean to him and the boy, boy just moved off and he said, well, you're on a bit of a red road at the moment. I'm just going to go in here and play. But it was the mother who said, hang on, you need to go and tell the teacher he's bullying you. And the boy just looked at his mum and he said, no, he's not. He's just on a red road out of control. He can come and play with me when, you know, when he's regained control. And the thing, the kids understand that you're not making me feel like this. I'm choosing to feel like this. And if someone else is on a red road, that's their choice too. You haven't made them. So that the first language change other than rough and smooth is instead of saying you are making me or it's your fault, you ban those from your vocab and the communities that have banned them um, have found that no one blames anymore. Instead, you just replace it simply with, you know what, I'm choosing to feel this way or I am choosing to respond this way, which means you can be anywhere on that, that map as long as you understand that you are choosing to be there. And as I said, that's with little things, you know, when huge things happen, that's when, your steering wheel gets hijacked by, you know, an incredibly difficult situation. That's not what this is about. But once you realise you are on, you've been hijacked onto the red road, you do get a choice whether or not you want to regain or maintain control on that road. So the little ones take to it really easily. The, um, the adolescents, they often take longer because they don't want to get out of the blame. Because they're adolescents. Exactly. And, you know, blame is their life. It's your fault. It's, not, it's nothing to do with me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good on every level. But it's the parents who use this and keep using the language. You don't force anyone to use this language. So parents, once they start using this language, you can say, listen, this is the way I'm going to communicate. Um, you don't have to use it back. But... With if schools, business, and no matter who are dealing with the young, they say if everyone is using this, when life gets to the pointy end, these people default to using the language because it's so much easier to come home and say, I'm a red road, I'm out of control, I'm going to my room because you know their room is a pet, which I'll explain in a minute. And adults, a lot of adults have been... Um, Oh, sorry. 
Sorry, I think I'm on a bit of a delay. I was going to ask, um, you know, for those who are parents of adolescents, and uh, Anthony and I just like are, you know, smiling back and forth here, you know, frantically taking notes. Um, so what you're suggesting is uh, for, for us, if we model that language um, every day in terms of our emotions and how we are taking control of our emotions, we discuss when we're feeling ourselves on those red roads or on those green roads and whether we're in control or whether we're out of control so that we're modeling to our children that we're acknowledging uh, where we are right now but also um, just modeling that behavior so that our children can therefore then start to describe that in the same um, the same language yeah absolutely absolutely because when you're out of control it's really hard to grab language because you're out of control because with with my turn this is out of control. Uh, this is your amygdala. The thumb represents your amygdala. And that's, as we know, the fight, flight, freeze reaction. This is your prefrontal cortex. And this is your thinking creative brain. So when you're out of control, your prefrontal cortex has run away. And this is where, you know, when we say to people, why are you behaving like that? Often they'll say, well, I don't know. And often they don't know because they're out of control. And this is a really good, families, even businessmen are using um, the sign language. There was a CEO the other day and he was in a meeting and he just went like that. And everyone just stopped and they didn't judge. And he just closed his eyes and breathed and then went on. And it's, it's just letting everyone know how you feel without having to use words, without... Because so often when we're like that, we use words that are really hurtful. Do you mind if I just describe... Thinking. Sorry, Jane. Do you mind if I just describe what you're doing? Because not everybody's watching the video. So when you're out of control, the fingers, the palm is facing forward with the fingers up and then your thumb is across the middle of your hand and that's the amygdala with a prefrontal cortex pointing to the ceiling, it's not in place. And so that's the signal for out of control. And out of control is uh, hurting other people, hurting yourself in some way or hurting something. Um, and then you've closed the fingers over the top, kind of like a, a fist um, with the thumb inside. So you'd never teach somebody in martial arts to put their thumb inside their fist. Uh, no. <laughs> but this is this is the amygdala with the prefrontal cortex, which has got the control in, in it. And that's the sign that you're back in control. So that CEO put his hand up with the fingers up and the thumb in place um, to say that he was out of control. He needed a minute. He took a few breaths and then he closed his hand to indicate that he's back in control. And then the meeting progressed and there was no judgment. Um, it's just for the people who are listening and not watching um no it's uh, a good idea <laughs> just, just trying to <laughs> think about them too absolutely absolutely so it's it's knowing that it's it's also um going back to what you were saying marika about parents demonstrating it for teenagers it's showing them you know i was out of control when that happened when I said that to you, I was out of control and this is the way I got back in, into control. And this is where I in, introduce PETS and TEPS. Um, PETS stand, PET stands for Personal Emotional Tool and TEP stands for Triggers for Extra Precaution. Now, they're the same letters, but they're the reverse because life is about perspective. And we know it's all about mindset because... If you have a negative mindset, um, then that is actually going to program your RAS, which is your reticular activating system, to filter out things around you that are negative. And if you're using language that it's always your, someone else's fault, it's always, you know, blame is out there, then your RAS is programmed to look for blame. And this language starts to teach you how to get back in control and so to reprogram your RAS because we have the stimuli that could be coming into our brain as hundreds of thousands of things. And if they all came in at once, we'd explode. And so the RAS, which is in the brainstem, is there to filter it out. So it, it lets in about 100 things at once. But you are in charge of that filter and that is exciting. And that's where this language helps to control 
um, that filter as well. So that's, that's good. And so this is where the language comes. So TEPS, which stands for Triggers for Extra Precaution, um, people say, well, why don't you just use the word trigger? And I say, because trigger already has a negative connotation. That's my trigger. Whereas TEP is a made up word, so it doesn't have any negative connotations. And it was interesting, I had a policeman who said, when I was doing it with the community, he said, well, I'm not gonna use that language. You know, some people cite the language as an obstacle, which is interesting because you think about the language everyone's using at the moment. Google, Snapchat, you know, Twitter, tweet. Aren't they weird words? But no one questions the word. Whereas if people are questioning these words, it's often they're not questioning the word, they're actually questioning what's behind it. So he said, I'm not gonna use that language. And I said, oh, that's absolutely fine, you don't have to. And he was dealing with some teenagers who um, were at a school that had been taught this language and they were multiple offenders. And every time he said to them, what made you do that? They would get really defensive and cross and um, it wouldn't get, go anywhere. It would just make things worse, exacerbate the situation. And so one day he just said to one of them, so what was your TEP? And he said, the kid just told him, because a TEP is out here. It's not, it, there's no judgment. We all have TEPs. TEPs could be um, the alarm clock in the morning. That could be your first TEP. That influences you to go on a red road. It doesn't make you, it influences you. Parents, getting the kids up, getting everyone dressed, getting them out to work, getting the lunches done, thinking what you're going to have to, to buy to cook tonight. What are we going to, these are all minor tips. And if you don't deal with them with a pet, which helps you empty that glass, then your glass becomes full. And as I say to people, if I'm holding a glass of water, is that heavy? No, it isn't. But what happens if I hold it for a week, two weeks? two months, two years, 10 years. And this is what's happening. It's all this accumulation of the daily stresses that fill up and then just, you can imagine if your cup is overflowing, it doesn't take much to keep it there. Something small happens and, and that's road rage. You know, you could just quietly go in front of someone and that person goes nuts. Now they're on a red road out of control and their glass is obviously full. And there's no blame there. You know, there's, it's, and it's understanding that rather than giving them the finger back because then everything just, you know, accum you know, just gets worse and worse. And this is what we're doing. You know, everyone's retaliating because they're blaming. And it's not only people, it's countries. You bomb me, so I'm going to bomb you. Or cultures, you, your culture did this to us, so we're going to do this to your culture. And this blame and retaliation cycle just never leaves. And that's why it's only by introducing an everyday language that is going to start getting us out of this. So the TEPs are the triggers that slowly fill your glass. And PETs, personal emotional tools, are the things that you use to empty them. And that's, uh, for example, with the mindfulness-based techniques. Um, that's what pets are. But if you ask people, um, what's, you know, what is it that is going to get you back in control? Um, so what's the bridge? And that's what pets are. They're the bridge between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. They don't fix the situation. What they do is they put you back in control with a thinking, creative brain. So then you can and not every situation can be fixed but how can I regain control and maintain control on this rough road because I'm not going to leave it for a while especially I mean as we know Melbourne's now in lockdown for another six weeks there are a lot of people out of control on a red road at the moment and this is why I'm so desperate to get this out there to give them a means of saying don't judge yourself it's okay to be on that red road out of control but you need to regain control and stay on that red road. Businesses are dying, you know, there's, it, the world is changing. Our future is totally uncertain. Of course it's okay you're on a red road. But because we're still stuck in, you've got to be on this green road in control and everyone's saying, how are you coping? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, no, you're not. You know, if you can just do that, everyone would say, yeah, me too. You know, it's, it's, 
It's okay to be like that. And pets range for everyone. And most people have no idea what their pets are because we do it for them. For example, I've got nothing to do. I'll give you something to do. Um, teachers in playgrounds, um, so-and-so, you know, they won't play with me. Okay, I'll find you someone who will. What happens if you then get to university and you've got no one's there to, to pick you up and say, oh, you haven't got any friends, I'll give you one. It's about saying, you know what, I, no matter how many people are around me, there's times when I feel really lonely, really alone. And when I ask people, there's not one person who doesn't experience that. And you say, that's okay, you're on a rough road at the moment and you might go out of control. So what's the pet to use? And for some people, it can be breathing, it can be exercise, um, it can be cooking a really beautiful meal, it could be music, dancing. I mean, the list is endless. Um, because even with adults, I say to them, okay, what are your pets? It's really hard to get beyond alcohol and chocolate and exercise. And unfortunately, what happens with those three pets is when they get overdone, they then become a tip. And this is what happens with great achievers as well. If you're dealing with athletes and they start to overachieve, like it's a pet for them because they just love it. But once they overachieve, it becomes a tip and that puts them on the red road. So it's, it's understanding, and that's why it's called my turn, you need to understand, okay, let's make a list of what my daily tips are. Now, what's a pet that I could use to go with that? And this needs to be done before you're like this. Because when you're like this, it's too late. You're not going to be able to think of a pet. But you can grab one that you've thought of. When you're and out of control, you mean? Exactly. If, sorry for those. You know, if you're out of control, it's really hard because your prefrontal cortex isn't there. So it's, most people can't think of a pet in that situation. So you need to do this yourself. Uh, you do it with your clients, you do it with your family, you do it, everyone has a list of tips and their pets will be totally different. But they need to understand that that's their power to be able to get back in control no matter what the person or circumstance, the tip, um, it is, you're able to regain control and hopefully maintain control. So, yeah, so there's, there's people who take to it straight away because they're willing to take responsibility. And that's a big one. A lot of people don't want responsibility. Like I'm coming to you as a therapist to fix me. And if you don't fix me, then you're the failure. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of therapists think you're coming to me to be fixed. I need to fix you. And when they can't, they feel a failure. And you need to be and with your kids. You know, they might do or say something and you think, my God, I've failed. No, you haven't. This is, and this is where you talk about that was a rough choice that you made. And, and it's talking about what road do you think they're on? And what road do you think they were on when they said that? Do you think they were in or out of control? It's, it's understanding. And kids get this really quickly. Like I had a, a girl the other day who said, you know what, the girl next to me bites her nails and, you know, I can hear it and it's a real tip for me. And, it, you know, it, it influences me to go out of control. But then I thought it's probably a pet for her. Biting her nails probably helps get her back in control. And so instead of just saying, stop doing that, I said to her, is biting your nails a pet for you? And she said, yeah. And she said, so what's the tip that makes you want to bite them? And this was an adolescent. They were adolescents. And they, the girl said, it's when my parents fight. And she said, we suddenly had this incredible conversation about um, you know, dealing with parents who are fighting and what road are they on? They're on the red road. Do you have to go on that road too? No. And so the pet she's chosen now is when her parents do that and she's not in danger, she actually goes to her computer and starts writing a book. You know, she's, she's now written a few chapters because that's what she loves to do. 
rather than feeling that this situation is out of control, my life is out of control, my world is spiralling down. She's managed just through thinking, well, that's their road, not mine. I don't have to go on that. Okay, what's a pet that I can use when they do that? I'll go and, and do this. And she's now back in control. So it sounds like, too, when you're sharing this language, that there's a lot more um, empathy for for friends and family and people around us when you start to reframe those ideas that, um, and, you know, even with our own children, too, you know, we can sometimes just, we can be in that on that red road and out of control and hit that, oh, my God, why can't you just bloody do it? Um, and, you know, <laughs> we, we all have these challenges every day and it makes... Absolutely. Like, listen, listening to you talk Jane like it's it's so useful because I can really I can see with my children they would really take to this and I think part of it too is um um, for those of you that are listening you know Jane's got some um some images that she's got behind her on the wall which if you look at the video you can see but we will talk later about the resources that you can actually um buy from Jane so you can buy all the resources which explain how it works and some of the images and things but I think you know, for the visual learners, I think it's great that you've got these images with the colours and the, and the road maps, but also, you know, for the pets as well. Um, you know, I, I was just saying to Jane before we went on, I've actually printed it up and I want to get it laminated so I can sort of say to my kids, okay, you know, at the moment, if you're feeling out of control, are there any of these which you think can help you right now? Um, because, so that they can bring themselves back into control and start to take some of that... Um, that ownership and and learn the skills for themselves so that again that can transfer to school because in a busy school classroom you know you're not always going to have the support and help that you need but if you have some of those tools that you can kind of go okay well I know that I one of my pets is just taking three deep breaths or actually you know what I need to I need to leave you know, I need mm. to be able to have an opportunity to walk out the door because this is too overwhelming for me. So maybe I can talk to a teacher about, um, you know, when I give a signal and maybe that, you know, it, it sounds like it's so much easier when the whole school is on board with a program because if everyone knows that hand signal is like, I'm out of control, I need you to step outside and just, you know, take a few breaths. Um, it would be a lot, <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it's interesting. There was uh, a group of girls at at one school that were getting into trouble every recess and lunch. And once we did this, they realised that the group leader, when she got really cross, one of her pets was to be on her own. But she would get really cross and run away. Well, they'd all follow her. And so following her meant that she'd turn around and say something really nasty and make it even worse. And then they're all on a rough red road. Whereas now what they, because they understand that that's her pet, that's one of her pets, they let her go and they keep playing. And when she regains control, she comes back in and there's no judgment. Now, obviously this doesn't work all the time. This isn't a panacea. There's going to be times when she loses control and swears back at them or says something nasty, et cetera. This, but it's, it's the majority of times people are in control. There was, as part part of the visuals, there was a two and a half year old and he um, didn't have much language. And they were using, for the people who who are listening, I'm just holding up the map here. It's It's a magnet, but you can print this off the website and laminate it yourself and put it on the fridge. And he knew that was there. And there's little cars that go with it that you can actually stick where you are. Well, he was in the kitchen with his mum and his mum said oh daddy's home and the little boys two and a half went and got his car and put it on the green side well dad came home and went straight into the newborn baby didn't come in and see the little two and a half year old and normally he would just throw an absolute tantrum because he doesn't have the words and scream and shout and they'd put him in his bedroom for time out and the next night dad would have come home and said well I'm not going to celebrate that behaviour. You're going to go to your room again. And, but because they had this, what the little boy did is he ran into the kitchen, grabbed his car and took it off and slammed it onto the red road. Now, immediately they knew his mindset and um, they knew that dad coming home and not having something to do with him was, was 
influencing him to go on a red road out of control. So what they do now is dad comes home, comes into the two and a half year old and together they go and see the newborn baby. Such a simple change. But instead of having a kid that is thinking, why is dad going to see the newborn baby first? Doesn't he like me anymore? Um, doesn't he love me? Don't I fit into this family? What's happened? Have I done something wrong? And then project that out into a teenager. I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I don't fit in. And then out into an adult. And because this kid had a visual way of expressing incredibly complex emotions just by moving his car, they were able to, you know, um, put a stop to that ever-increasing feeling that I'm, I'm no good, I don't fit in. Isn't it interesting that, um, that something so simple as a car on one road or a different type of road can, just because language creates meaning, is able to communicate so effectively when a child of two has what? They can string two words together in general, right? Um, uh, to be able to communicate how they're feeling so strongly, that's... That's, uh, that's really fantastic. And, and what I'm hearing from you is that by using the language consistently, we're practicing when we're on the good roads, on the, on the smooth green roads, as well as practicing when people are on the rough red roads, uh, because we're always training. Absolutely. And, um, and what I heard you say, and it reminded me of a quote that I learned long ago. Um, and the way that I learned this quote was under pressure, we don't rise to the occasion, we fall to the level of our training. And that, that came to mind. Mm. What we're doing is we're always training so that when we are going out of control, we fall to the level of training, we, we fall to using the tools that we've been practicing, the language we've been using, and recognizing those TEPs, those, uh, those events that, that do make us take extra precaution that's the e and the p um well done. <laughs> to, to um to to they're almost like signposts hey you know this could this could send me out of control so uh we're doing that and um one of the other things that i heard you say was the whole uh taking on the responsibility from therapists and from trainers and coaches to be honest um and one of the things that i i hear a lot of um out there in the health and fitness world is how much responsibility people are taking on. And, and we've spoken about it um, on the podcast before and, and, and how, you know, burnout occurs because people mm. feel this responsibility. They feel the failure of not being able to help. Um, and it sounds like this is a great resource to be able to recognize when those events are occurring and, and to be able to put in place, some of those are personal emotional tools, the pets, and learning what they are. And one of the things that I found interesting in, in your resource, it's, it's called the therapist pack, right? And um, in it, there's a flow chart that you can work through. And are you on a red road or a green road? And then it just goes through some simple questions just to help you work through the situation that you're in, no matter what situation you're in. And one of the, one of the end points is, hey, I think you found a new pet. So it, it even helps you develop those skills and helps you to find those, uh, those things that help to empty the glass or to, re, to recharge the batteries or to you know, regain control. So going from being mm. out of control to being back in, into control, using the pets as a bridge, as you say, uh, between the amygdala and the... Um, and the prefrontal cortex. How are we going on all that? Um, yeah. <laughs> we can definitely tell that you are bursting at the seams to just spread this message out there. It's, um, it's wonderful to, to hear um, you speak so passionately about this. And, and already I'm thinking of all the different situations that I could use it because, you know, I have outbursts as a parent. Um, I, feel many different pressures from work and from personal life and all these what other about things. Buying stock kits, Anthony? Beg your pardon? 
What about by the soccer pitch, Anthony? By the soccer pitch, I, I do not call out negative things on the soccer pitch. I only call out positive things. Uh, I just have a loud voice so that it doesn't matter where you are on the field, you will be able to hear my encouragement um, <laughs> <laughs> and let you know when a defender is coming on you. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, you know, can you talk just a little bit more about some of the neuroscience and the therapies that are that have been embedded within my turn city um, because you have based it on science and you have based it on therapies that exist in the uh, in the psychological world as well as well as in you know counseling and um, mm. you know personal development uh, world can you tell Absolutely. us a bit more about well, the, that the acceptance commitment theory for example that is trying to make you non-judgmental about your how you feel, but within that it calls them negative emotions. So this goes a step further by saying, yes, you can feel whatever you like, but none of them are negative. And you just have to know whether you're out of control or in control and how you're going to get back into control. So that's a really important part of it. And the, the CBT part is the language because language dictates how you think and feel and your behavior. And it needs to be everyday language because at the moment, the language you're using, if you're saying um, it's my fault, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, and you've developed that six lane highway, neural pathway in your brain, that's leading to a destination you don't wanna to go to. But because it's a six lane highway now, it's so much easier than going down the bush bashing, you know, creating a new pathway. So your pathway might be you come home from work, you come home from or, or you just finally got the kids to bed or whatever it is. And you are out of control and you reach for a bottle of wine, beer, chocolate, cakes, whatever it is. And you overdo it because you're out of control and you go down that road and you know the destination you're going to feel awful and it's that pattern of you know i'm hopeless i'm useless i've got no willpower etc well what this language does is it creates new neural pathways you know when you're feeling like that you start to say well hang on i'm choosing to feel this way that's a tip for me what's a pet i could use to help get back in control and you start creating that new neural pathway this is what's so exciting when I go back to communities because the, the change of, you know, because neuroplasticity is such a magic part of our brain, but they don't even realise it's happening. And I'll go there and I'll say, so how's it going? Oh, we don't really use it that much anymore. And, and then they think about it and they think, well, there's no blame and there's, no, hmm, actually, you know what? I use it all the time. And their default now is the new neural pathway. They're forgotten. I'll go back to a school and I'll say to the kids, well, when I first came here, you said red roads were bad. I'm like, no, we didn't. You need red roads. They're what built resilient, you know. They, but that's, that's my, my idea of having it every day is to change those neural pathways. And that's what the CBT is, you know, that cognitive behaviour therapy is what starts to change all that. And the mindful... Uh, mindfulness-based cognitive behaviour, well, cognitive therapy as well, is talking about having things, you know, where you become mindful. But often they only use breathing and meditation. And a lot of people, breathing and meditation is a tip for them. They don't want that. You know, that, that influences them to go out of control. Whereas this absolutely embraces mindfulness, but let's look at it on a bigger scale and that's personal to you. And that's where the personal emotional tools come. And as I said, this isn't a panacea. There's going to be times when you lose control, but it's owning that. Because if you never lose control, how do you ever learn how to regain control, which is part of our growing? So perfect is being in control on any road. It's not, it's the yin and yang. That's what perfection is, the balance. And we've lost that because at the moment, perfection is just pure white and it's totally unattainable. You know, as a parent, we're supposed to be perfect parents. And it was interesting. I did a survey of 500 parents and I said, what do you want for your children? And every one of them 
in their answer said, I want them to be happy. Well, you've failed already because your kid is gonna be happy and sad and all sorts of things. Don't just center on happiness. Center on, I want my kid to be able to learn to regain control when I'm not there on any road. And that, that is what you want. But going back to those um, narratives that I was talking about, you know, we're supposed to be happy and in control and smooth all the time. And it's killing us, literally. So, yeah, it's time to, to change that. I'm, I'm glad and you mentioned about the, um, the mindfulness uh, and meditation side of things being a trigger for some people or being a, being a pet, uh, tap for some people. Because I know for my daughter, you know, she's been told so many times, you know, you need to do some meditation and some breathing exercises. And to her, it's like it's so awful um, it's actually, it's a, it's a tip for her. She hates it. It, it makes mm. her feel worse um, to try and like, you know, control what's going on in her brain and to, you know, and she's like, and when people say, you know, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Tell us about your feelings. And she's like, and that's why, you know, um, psychology was a nightmare. She's like, I don't know how I feel. I, <laughs> I wish people would bloody stop asking me how I feel. I feel all these different things all the time. And I don't, I don't know how to describe it and I don't want to talk about it with you. Um, and I think, again, this gives that opportunity to sort of say, I'm on a red road. Absolutely. Make it simple. Make it simple. Yeah. Well, if, if I said to you now, how are you feeling? You know, how are you two feeling? There's, there's that feeling of, well, I'm not sure and I don't think I want to share it anyway because there's so much judgment about that's why, you know, the are you okay days are wonderful. but most people, if you say Are you okay, they'll go, yep. You know, they, because we've still got that stigma that you're supposed to be okay. Well, what does okay mean? Okay mm -hmm. means that you, you're in control of where you are or I'm not okay, I'm out of control at the moment, but you know what, that's okay. I, you know, I, need, I know what I need to get back in control. And it's also understanding that if you can't find something to get back in control, that's when you ask. That's when you say, I'm having difficulty getting back to here. And that's when you can work together. And that's why it's so important when your children are like this or when you are like this, you work out what your pets and tips are. So a small tip will in, require a small pet. So mm -hmm. pets need to be appropriate for what the tip is. For yeah. example, your tip might be meetings. Well, your pet can't be to go on a 3K run because you've got to be at the meeting. So you might find that breathing and doing something with, my, with your hands or your toes, so breathing in and opening your hands, breathing out or the other way or um, just suddenly looking for everything red around you because as soon as you suddenly bring that thinking prefrontal cortex into play, it starts to get you back in control out of that. So you might, while someone's talking, you might just look at the green around you or how many things are green or, um, or it could be breathing. And people where it's a really big tip, often that needs a really big um, physical pet. Okay, there's a, I've got a, um, a series of push-ups. I, I had one teenager, 16. He, um, he would literally pick kids up and throw them when he got really cross. And for him, if he was in the class, uh, he needed to be really um, physical. He would suddenly drop and do 50 push-ups and no one would say anything. He could have been out on that because they understood that's what he needed. And they knew when he was like that, that would be good for anyone. Better than throwing a kid. Yeah, exactly. And so it's understanding what, in, and he also created a circuit at home that he could do um, and time himself. And, and that gets you into that prefrontal cortex. Um, and, it, and it is, it's a discipline, but it needs to be done every day. So it becomes a default. It becomes that new neural pathway. And because you're changing your mindset from being out of control to in control, from being a victim to being someone who's in control, you've changed your mindset. So 
in changing your mindset, you then influence your reticular activating system to then filter in things that is um, supporting a more positive mindset as well. So even though it appears so simple, it's incredibly complex what this language is doing behind the scenes. And that's what the problem I have with a lot of people is they look at it and they go, red roads, green roads, what's that? You know, that's, that's nothing. You know, they, because it's so simple, they don't realise its power. But anything that's really valuable needs to be simple because otherwise people won't do it. Uh, yeah, we have these conversations with clients all the time, right? You know, we want to get so elaborate with, you know, um, you know, for instance, if someone has back pain and you're saying, oh, I think you should you know, go for a bit of a walk, do a couple of these little simple stretches. Well, hang on. That's a bit basic, isn't it? It's like sometimes the simple stuff just works. Exactly. Um, Jane, <laughs> we're really cognizant of your time and, and with just a couple of things we just wanted That's to okay. pull up with. Um, I would really love it if you could just take an opportunity to tell people how, uh, what, what are the resources and what packs they come in and how people can get a hold of them, um, whether they're just for people in Australia or, or, or around the globe. If you don't mind just taking a few minutes, just tell us about you know, the, the program and how people can get their mitts on them. That would be great. Okay, cool. Well, um, it's all on the website. So it's myturn, M-Y-T-E-R-N dot com dot A-U. So that's the website. And in the shop part of the website, there are packs for, for people as well as individual things. So what I've tried to do is create um, packs that are suitable. You can have, for example, if you're a teenager or a young adult, there's a pack there that in it, it there's eight videos and those eight videos go for about three to four minutes each and you do one at a time. There's also the mini manual in the pack and you have the different charts, the DIY charts that you can follow and the language pattern changes. Um, and so that's a pack that you can have for a teenager or young adult. There's an adult pack. So these are for all individuals if you just want to do it yourself first. The adult pack's the same. It's got the same um, style of eight videos and the My Turn manual. Um, there's a mini manual which explains everything briefly. But on the website, I've written a book called It's My Turn to Take Emotional Responsibility Now. And that goes into the detail of everything. Um, why, why I created it, what it is, it gives um, activities that you can do, um, etc. Then uh, it also has my research in it for people who are interested in the research. But on my website, if you go to um, the education side, down the bottom of that page, you can download the papers that I've written. With the therapist pack, uh, there are videos again, and these videos are for the therapist but they're also to give to the client. So you give them the, the, the links. So it comes with YouTube links. So you give your client the YouTube links and you may give them a couple each time you see them. So they're, they're just seeing a bit of um, the, the skill. You can give them the mini manual, which um, you get the PDF of that as well so you can read it and you can give it to other people as a therapist it outlines you know the all the different theories and why you should use it it shows you how to use the map in pain management or in diet or however it, it's meant to be so you can actually it'll give you um the pdf of of the map you can print it out and and also the cars you can actually use it as if you laminate it with the clients and say, okay, well, what road were you on this week mainly? Which side of the, of the city were you? What road are you on now? Um, what was the TEP? So you then start to talk about the conversation. And if they are saying they were on a really rough road because of the pain, um, you, you, know, you then start getting them to put the pain in perspective. Well, you know, with, uh, were you expecting to be pain free? Yes, well, can you see that was probably an unrealistic expectation for the first week? You know, that's um, so it just gives you um, a language to use 
with the therapist and the client. So that common language and it'll build up over time and make it better. And there's, um, there's posters and all sorts of things in that as well. There's also a family pack that you can get, which um, has five videos that are sort of like play school, you know, where I'm going, hi, welcome, you know, and it's, a, it's really good for kids from one year to 10 years, for example. So the, that will introduce um, the whole thing to the young children and it's really good for the adults to listen to as well because you get a different perspective. And so they're five half hour ones. You also get the teenager and young adult videos for the rest of the family. And you get the my turn, um, the mini my turn manual and all the resources of the pet sheet, the tip sheet the, to give you an idea and the language pattern changes. So there's all of those sort of things. You can get the packs, but you can also buy most of those things individually. The packs are the only ones that contain the videos, but you could buy the parent manual, which comes with a family pack as well. You could buy that individually if you wanted to, just to check it out. Um, the, I've tried to keep everything really inexpensive. So the individual, like the, the teenager one and the adult one are $19.99. And the family one's forty nine, ninety nine, uh, and the therapist one. So trying to keep it individual, and it's a one off payment, um, and you've got those resources for as as long as you like. Um, but the website itself has got the you know it shows some of the mini scenarios, so you can see how you can use the language in real life. Um, yeah, it's. Also, um, alongside that, I've got some apps. And uh, as we know, with technology also comes a lot of rough red roads. And I know with my, my turn app, um, I've had a lot of rough roads with that. Um, but that's all part of the growth. But there's, there's different ones. There's also the emoji app where you communicate just using a car out of control. And um, you, your children and you can communicate incredibly complex things really easily with just a picture. So we're getting rid of words entirely. Um, you know, you could just send, your teenager could send you the emoji of out of control on, you know, a person out of control in their car. Immediately you know where they are without them having to say, I'm depressed, I'm upset, I'm, you know, because those words so few of them use you know they just stay in that experience but on top of that i also have i i do i've continued the daily text from 2012 which is when i started it with the uni students and i actually still have a couple of thousand on my sms that i sms every day and i have no idea who they are because they just text my turn to my phone and i anonymously and i just add them to the list so, but I've got um, Instagram is my turn city, and that is a daily text Monday to Friday. Why don't I do? Why don't I do it Saturday and Sunday? Because everything that anything that comes consistently loses its power. Whereas you need some time without it. Whereas you actually have to think, well, I'd like a message now. I'll actually go back to the bank of um, messages, or you know, go back in in Instagram because I think there's about five hundred there. Um, so the idea is to start, even if you just start subscribing to the Instagram a day, it's also on my Facebook page a day, I, um, which is my turn city. And I post, um, a saying, for example, two of the students, the first year students who this actually, um, stopped them suiciding. One of them said the, the text that really turned them around was, are you driving under the influence of someone else's emotion? Remember, you can stop and take control. And one of the boys, what he, cause he was actually just gonna go and drive into a tree. And he said the text that changed him said, um, if you're on a red road and you're out of control at the moment, it's okay, just slow down take a deep breath and know that no road lasts forever. And he said that clicked something in his, his mind. 
But it's when you look at it daily, there'll be some days you'll look at it and say, I so needed to hear that. Other days you might look at it and not even read it. You might just look at the pretty picture because I put a picture and they're, they're always my photos where I've taken, I take when I travel. And a lot of people who know me, when they read the text, they think, oh, Jane's not having a good day. <laughs> you know, it could be being out of control on a red road. But it's, uh, so that's a way that, that you can have it um, a daily text and start it dripping into your life and um, the, yeah, using the emojis. There's, there's so many different ways that you can start, but you need to do it slowly. This is a language. You don't just learn French overnight. You know, I've had parents come to me after a week and say it doesn't work. <laughs> of course it's not going to work in a week. You are trying to change neural pathways that have been, you know, and especially with adults, they're like ditches, the neural pathways, whereas children are like this. So it's very easy to change those. But adults, you need to drip that in for a while before you start changing your pathways and then changing your mindset and changing your life. Because at the moment, there's so much out there that we cannot control. And this is where this is so important. But no matter what's happening, you always can regain control of that steering wheel. No one is making you, as I said, for those minor things. And having the pets that help you empty that glass so it never gets full. But you might get a giant tip that fills it straight away. Well, you either going to need a very strong pet or a series of pets to change that. And it's being kind to yourself. It's being admitting when, um, you know, you're on a rough road and you were out of control or you got out of control on that smooth road um, and saying, and this is the pet I use to try and get myself back in control. Be the role model to your friends, your family, your clients, whoever it is, because that is what will change. Fantastic messages, Jane. Um... I really, um, I really have enjoyed reading the material. I've really enjoyed listening about my turn and, and how you've created this system, this language. Um, my job is to summarize the whole podcast now. Um, you know, it, it's based on <laughs> neuroscience. It's, um, you know, my turn, T-E-R-N stands for taking your emotional responsibility now. Um, and you know, it has, uh, it has metaphors, which are, are not judging, not judgmental. So roads, uh, you know, you've got rough red roads, you've got green, smooth roads, you've got steering wheels, you've got cars that, that people can use to indicate when they, uh, how they're feeling because there's meaning behind the language. Uh, so the example of that two-year-old being able to put the car on the red side to express how he was feeling when his father came home. Uh, that was, you know, that's an example, a story that would stick in my mind. Um, you know, not letting people hijack your car, um, you know, choosing to respond, recognizing the triggers that require extra precautions, the TEPs, and having personal emotional tools um, and discovering your own tools, because that's going to allow you to empty the cup. Because if the cup overflows, that's when you tend to be out of control. Even the hand signal, so the hand up and the thumb in, uh, being the out of control, and then closing that prefrontal cortex over the top. Uh, such an easy and simple hand signal uh, to use to, to, to be able to describe how you're feeling. Um, I love how it's based in science. I love how you did a PhD on it. I love that it was effective uh, immediately. You know, you had um, people let you know that it stopped them from committing suicide. Um, that's very, very powerful. It's applicable for all ages from the very young all the way up through to adults, um, people in pain, people who are doing dealing with stresses in their life. Um, the consistency of practice is so important. The language um, dictating the mentality that we have. And you spoke earlier about, you know, uh, when we choose to blame and, and judge, it, it really um, places you in the victim mentality, 
which is a, a difficult place to live. It's not a it's not a healthy place to live, and so being able to use these tools to be able to help you um, and to be able to recognize situations that are arising um, allows you to be in control, whether you're on a red road or a green road. Um, you also have a whole bunch of different resources. There's things to read like the mini manual. There's things to watch like the, the YouTube videos, there's scenarios, there's uh, emojis so that you can communicate even without words. And there's things like the flow chart and um, as well as, you know, more resources uh, for therapists and educators, um, as well as for parents and then individuals, uh, adolescents, teenagers, um, and, and the younger kids as well. Um, you know, I hope, I hope that's been a fair summary. Um, I love the reticular activating system. You know, I, I love the games that you can play with that where you get people to look for all the red things and then you ask them to say, oh, name me something that was green. You know, like it, it just shows how we filter things in and out. Um, mm. And so being able to train yourself to be able to look for those things, um, to be able to change that. And I love the idea of practice. I love the idea that therapists can take that emotional responsibility and not take on the responsibility for how their clients are behaving and, and their results. Um, mm. that, that's really hit home for me as well. Uh, we mm. really appreciate your time. We will have all the links in the show notes. Um, and otherwise, uh, did you have anything to add, Marika? the mute button thing. <laughs> Sorry, I'll unmute myself. That would be useful. Fantastic wrapping up as always, Anthony. Um, I have to say this, this uh, talk has given me lots of food for thought. Um, I am going to sit down with my kids because we're on school holidays now and, and take them through, through some of the information and show them, um, show them maps talk to them about um, pets and tips and I actually can see how valuable this would be in our household and will probably reduce some of hopefully the um, screaming and uh, out of control. <laughs> That'll times. still go on. That'll still go on. But yeah, it's, it it's will... reduce, not eliminate. <laughs> exactly. Well done. <laughs> but I think also having that conversation with them about um, being okay to be on the red roads and that we all have those days all the time you know this is just part of being alive and being human and you know uh, we don't need to be skipping with joy every minute of every day um, that's just not our that's just not a reality and and a little bit of um, travel on the red roads on those bumpy roads is going to help them build a little bit of resilience and help them um, you know cope better with life but I, I just love this whole philosophy because I think just that ownership and that power of that, that empowerment that comes with that process of of being you know being in control and responsible for your own emotions but also that empathy of understanding that hang on if that that person's on a red road and they're out of control and there might be something that's going on with them that has nothing to do with me um there might be something else entirely and and they're on that red road and i'll give them a bit of space to figure out what they need um i think is really lovely as well i think, I think that's, that's absolutely perfect. and anyone who's doing something to hurt someone else is on a red road out of control and you don't have to go there. And as you say, it's that empathy of knowing, well, they have tips in their life that I don't even know about. Yeah. And it, yeah. yeah, it's not condoning their action. It's understanding it, which is really important. And then giving you the, the power to respond. Beautiful. So, thank you so much, Jane. And we will absolutely put all those links in the show notes and we encourage everyone to jump on the website and have a look around, have a look at the free resources, check out um, the resource packs that you can purchase as well. Check out the Instagram, Facebook. Um, we'll put all those links below. Um, and other than that, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. That's my pleasure. Well, I appreciate the fact that you're interested in getting this sort of thing out there. So thank you. You're welcome. Lots of people, lots of people listening to this podcast will, will certainly derive lots of benefit. And, um, you know, it's, it's been fantastic to share that with everybody. So thank you for your time and um, we'll catch up with you another time.
Yeah, and lovely to meet you both and uh, hope everyone out there is able to learn how to regain and maintain control of their own steering wheel. Fantastic. Thanks, okay. Jane. And Thanks. say hello to Thor for me as well. Right. I'll certainly do that. <laughs> well, that's it for this episode. Be sure to hit like if you enjoyed the episode and leave any comments or questions below. We'd really like to hear from you. If you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so now so that you can be kept notified when we release our next episode. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we look forward to having you back with us for another episode of the Women's Health Podcast.